Well, Mr Trump has, of course, promised to shake things up, and shake things up he has, whether intentionally or not. Within a couple of days of his first call as president to Russia's Vladimir Putin, flight, fighting flared up in Ukraine after two years of relative peace. The conflict there dates back to the overthrow of President Viktor Yanukovych of Ukraine in the revolution of 2014. But as politicians who backed closer links to Europe took power, protests erupted in the east of the country, home to many ethnic Russians. Russia was accused of supporting the fighters with weapons and soldiers. Not guilty, it said. In 2015, after many failed attempts to end the war, a truce was signed between the parties, which led to a shaky ceasefire. Some of the fiercest fighting in the last week or so has centred on the government-held town of Avdivka. They thought they'd seen it all in the front-line town of Avdivka. But this past week has been worse than anything they've ever known. Shell fire, sporadic here for two and a half years, has suddenly become intense. A huge bombardment of artillery cut off the town's power and water for days. With temperatures dropping to minus 20, the cold could be every bit as deadly as the weaponry they face. At a respite centre, battle-ready soldiers serve hot food and tea to anyone who needs it. This place is basic, to say the least, but it was set up in haste and under pressure. The heated tents are crowded with people swapping news and charging phones. But civilians are dying here, and grief sits side by side with anger. The weekend saw a lull, but people are still ready to retreat to their basements and their bunkers. But there are those who simply can't escape. In a three-room apartment in one of the town's endless tower blocks, we met Nella. She's old, she's infirm, and she suffers from asthma. She can't make it to the basement, she told me, so she just sits and waits, terrified, until it stops. In the room next door, the children sit drawing. This is how seven-year-old David passes the day. He seems happy, but a closer look at his jotter tells a different story. All he draws is violence, his mother tells me. It's disturbing to watch. Behind all of the immediate problems the people here face, there is another grinding concern. They feel completely abandoned, stuck in the middle of a deadly game of brinkmanship between their own government in Kiev and Moscow. And little wonder they're losing hope. Even the town's churchyard bears the scars of shell fire. Nowhere is sacred in this conflict. But people do still come here to find sanctuary. Several services every day, the congregation's always large. For those who've lost faith in the outside world, at least there's still somewhere left to turn. Well, moving scenes there from Avdivka. Martin is now uh, in Kramatorsk, uh, and in our studio here is our international affairs uh, editor, Ragi Omar. Let's go to Ukraine first. Um, Martin, the fighting goes on tonight with reports of more shelling. 
Yeah, that's what we're hearing, Tom, because just a few miles down the road from here, and we're hearing there was shelling this afternoon and this evening. I mentioned in my report there had been a lull at the weekend. That seems, perhaps, uh, to be coming to an end. Uh, there is good news, too, though. Water and power that have been cut off to much of the town has been restored. Now, if those supplies hold, that will fend off the worst of this bitter cold we're feeling here just now. But, of course, if this fighting continues to any real extent, those supplies could quite easily be knocked out again. It is important to point out at this stage, Tom, the fighting has been taking place in both directions. On the other side of that front line in the uh, city of Donetsk, rebel-held Donetsk, people have been killed by rockets and by shells fired from Ukraine and the humanitarian situation there is fairly bleak as well. The big question of course is who started this fresh spike in violence? Was it Ukraine drawing Russia into a fight at a time it might not want to fight when the world is watching it very closely, when Washington is talking about lifting sanctions on Russia? Or was it Russia just demonstrating its might, reminding w the, the world how strong it is when so much is up for grabs? For the people of Avdivka, that first scenario, Ukraine starting this, is, is beyond unpalatable. It's unthinkable because that would mean their government effectively sacrificing lives in the town to score political points. We don't know who started it for sure, Tom, and the fact of the matter is we may well never find out. OK, Martin, thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, let's go to Raggy now. Martin, I mean, don't know whether you heard what Martin was saying. He essentially asked the question, who started it? Could it really have been the Ukrainians? Well, there is a number of analysts who argue this point that with Ukraine worried by the closeness, perceived closeness between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, that somehow Ukraine might have manufactured this breakdown in the ceasefire in order to demonstrate to the world that they are a vulnerable you know, nation under a predatory Russia. I put this point to the uh, uh, Ukrainian ambassador to London, and she was very, very forthright in saying these were just blatant lies and propaganda from Russia. They said that there were no Russian troops on Crimea, but when the reality showed that that was like regular Russian troops and the Crimea was finally annexed. So I don't see why at this time we should just like by surprise believe Russians. And she made the point that although, you know, people may be arguing this, Russia has a long history, as she put it, of, you know, um, blindsiding the rest of the world in believing its case that there were no, you know, links between the separatists or Russian rebels uh, and, uh, and uh, Moscow. And she also said, actually, there'd been a phone call between President Poroshenko and Donald Trump at the weekend on Saturday. When I pressed her on that, she said that, actually, there'd been a lot of positives in that phone call, despite what everybody else might have thought between the closeness between Putin and Trump. And Mr Trump uh, said that he regarded this as a conflict between Russia and Ukraine and not somehow some kind of civil war within Ukraine and that Mr Poroshenko was, had been invited to Washington. So some positivity there. OK, Reggie, thank you very much uh, indeed.